All right, so a little preamble. Uh, I was going through this week's lesson, um, both lessons, you know, the one for today and then the one for Thursday. And what I discovered was that the Reading Thursday uh, has a lot of content about time leaf, which is great. Time leaf is really good stuff to learn. And so I shifted some of the content that we'll be talking about Thursday over to this presentation. So we're going to have a bit of time leaf uh, Monday and Thursday instead of just cramming it all into Thursday. Uh, and then we'll also uh, a bit more briefly go over Gradle and exceptions, which is what the reading covered. Uh, cool. So once again, what, we'll, what we will be learning about is uh, the build that Gradle file, uh, exceptions in Java, and then an intro to time leaf. And that's when we'll do the whole live coding thing. We're going to give this a shot. We'll see how it goes. Which is this alert? <laughs> Save my slides before I get to them. Uh, right. So we will at some point in this lecture we will code along. So I'll code and you'll code. And we'll do it together. See how it goes. Um, just so you know. So first section is uh, the build that Gradle. So what does the build dot Gradle do? Um, it does a lot of things, but usually it's just sort of sitting quietly in the background. And this is true from, I guess, my experience out there coding in a professional environment. You don't really think about the build.gradle that often until it's time to, to mess with it. Um, and so the build.gradle, if you remember like the package.json when we were using JavaScript with NPM, uh, that file handled things like installing dependencies. Um, it had little scripts in there we could run, like NPM, run, start, and things like that. And so the build.gradle is like the Java Gradle equivalent of the package.json. So quick comment here. Um, the, let's say you create a project using the spring initializer or something else like that, and it pre-configures your, your, your build.gradle file. Um, you may never interact with it except that as the project matures and you need new things, uh, the most likely thing that you will edit in your build.gradle is going to be the, depend the, the uh, dependency section. So you might add on a new dependency to your project as a pretty normal thing. And so, uh, yeah, we may go into Gradle file to, to edit that. And honestly, anything is up for grabs, but that would be the most likely scenario in my, in my head. Um, here's just a quick uh, screenshot of the dependency section of the build.gradle file. Um, and then this is the, the plugin section. You can notice in this example, we can tell that the project has Timeleaf uh, installed as part of it. Uh, and so you can actually learn a bit about a project just by looking at its dependencies. Uh, we can see we have Spring Boot Starter Web, Spring Boot Dev Tools. And so we kind of already have an idea of what this application is. Uh, so, we're about to context switch a bit. Before I do that, any questions about the build.gradle file? Am I, am I reading a bit? Is, is the volume okay? Good, all right, cool. Uh, any questions about the build.gradle file uh, or just configuring a Java project in general? Cool. Uh, exceptions. So we talked about exceptions in the past. Uh, so uh, we, I think we had uh, an entire section of like, the JavaScript portion where we wrote exceptions and we threw exceptions, we caught exceptions, all those good things. Uh, we're going to have a bit of the same thing with Java. And the two really key important things to keep in our mind when we think about exceptions, whether it's in Java or in JavaScript or any of these languages, uh, is, that, is that there's typically two, two key components. One is throwing an exception, and the other is catching the exception. And we'll talk a bit more about each of those here momentarily. Um, so we can intentionally throw exceptions in our code. We can, we can write and say, hey, I'm going to intentionally throw an exception right here. Um, or we might have a bit of code that, um, that throws an, ex ex uh, an exception that we didn't intend. Um, so 
if we ever have an exception thrown in our code or we have a block of code that's likely to throw an exception, we want to wrap that in something called a try catch. And you can think a bit of, you can think of a, a try catch a bit like a, a firefighter standing next to something that could randomly uh, combust. Uh, and so in this, this little illustration here, whatever this is right here, this represents codes that might burst into flames. And then you have someone right there ready to put out the fire. And so anything that happens in the try block that we're, uh, is going to be caught by the try catch block, um, with, with a few exceptions, like if there's like a syntax error or something like that. But when the code is actually running, whatever runs inside that try block uh, is going to be caught by the try block and it's not going to uh, destroy the entire application and cause it to crash, right? Uh, so why we might need to use exceptions in Java um, or understand them. So imagine a scenario in which we have a, uh, an app and the user can upload a file. Maybe they can upload a, an image or a document, like a resume, a resume or something like that. When you have like a user uploading files, you cannot guarantee that it's not going to cause something to crash um, or cause some sort of an exception. Another example might be if we're getting resources from another website. We can't guarantee that that website's always gonna be up and running. Maybe it's down one day. And then when we go to get the resources, that causes an exception. So um, when we have code like this, where we're re relying on something else, and we can't guarantee that it's not going to cause an exception, we're going to write, wrap that code in a try-catch block. Um, and so if the user's uploading something, that would be a great place to wrap that in a try-catch block. If we're requesting information from another website, um, that would be another, another really great example. And so these are examples of uh, us not intentionally throwing an exception, but us needing to protect our code from exception-prone Code. Uh, we can also throw exceptions. And so uh, you might be wondering why you would throw an exception intentionally. Uh, you would only throw an exception intentionally if you had a plan in place to catch the exception. And so uh, an example that this might seem a bit, a bit more useful in would be let's say you have a, an application and it's got a um, it's got like the main part of the application that's going to catch the exceptions. And then it's got a bunch of little tools. And each one of those tools, if they fail, will throw an error. And so all of those errors will be handled in one spot. And then you can have code that handles all of those different errors. And so, or exceptions is the right term. Uh, and so we're not going to get too far in the weeds on like throwing exceptions on our own. But it's definitely something that we can do. And it can be a good design pattern. Um, so a quick pause here. Uh, any thoughts and questions about exceptions? Okay. So we'll try to breeze, breeze through this. This is a, just some quick syntax on how we'd write our, our own custom exception. Once again, with Java, we're always in the space where we're writing a class. Uh, and in this case, we are extending the exception class. Um, here we have our constructor, and we are passing the exception message up to the exception class's constructor using the super thing right here. And then how we would throw our custom exception would be throw, and then we'd create a new instance of it, new custom exception, and then pass in the message. So this is something that you will for sure want to know about and want to use. Maybe you want to create your own custom exceptions, maybe not, but you for sure need to know about try-catches, right? Um, and so if we have code that we need to, to wrap in a try-catch, of course, we're going to put it in the try section, and then our catch section will, um, will catch the, those errors uh, or exceptions, technically. Uh, and so... Yeah, not, not much to say about that, um, more than I already have. So that brings us all the way to time leaf. So if you remember, we're going to try to get a jump start on this. Uh, before we transition to time leaf, last chance for, I guess, questions on exceptions uh, in, in Java. No questions.
questions pretty quiet up there. So, do you remember this madness? Uh, this was last class, right? Yeah. This is not happy. Um, so, why learn time leaf? Um, this slide tells us why to learn time leaf, but uh, essentially, writing HTML in Java can be a pain. We all experience that. It doesn't have to be a pain, though. And so we can use something called Timeleaf, and that will let us write HTML and use it in our Java code in a much better way than whatever this is. Better than that. So Timeleaf uh, has a lot of simu similarities to Angular, and I, I don't know how much the, the workbook really calls this out, so I'm going to emphasize this up in the lecture. Timeleaf is very similar to Angular, um, at least in, in how you set it up and interact with it. So here's a general Timeleaf example. So we have, um, this is, would be like what the Timeleaf file looks like. Everything here is normal HTML except for one thing. Can someone tell me what the one thing is that makes this different than vanilla HTML? Yes. And so this thing right here is just going to help um, IntelliJ uh, to recognize this as a timely file and so that it doesn't get angry at us when we try to do timely things. But yeah, generally speaking, this is uh, everything here is just normal HTML stuff we've worked with. Uh, what's really cool about timely is let's say I create a timely file called example HTML. For my website, I can just open that file in a web browser and just see my HTML, like in this example right here. Or I can start up my Java application and everything gets up and running, and then I can see my uh, my HTML with Java injecting data into it and all the fun stuff that Timeleaf lets us do. But it's it's very it's very portable and and usable in my opinion. So how do we set up Timely? Uh, there are, gener generally speaking, there are two ways. We can create a new project that has Timely added to it using this Spring Initializer, or we can edit an existing project and um, modify the build.gradle so we can um, add the Timely dependency. So uh, yeah, this is just a quick screenshot of the Spring Initializer. Um, this would be the addition right here, just Timely for that. And then this is what it looks like in the dependencies. We kind of already called that out earlier. So a few important things with timely. Um, all timely files, generally speaking, but all, all timely files should be located under resources forward slash templates. Um, we're going to put all of our timely files in the template folder. Let's say you have a controller that is going to return a timely file, meaning that when someone goes to a particular web address that we our application controls, and it goes like localhost forward slash hello, and we have a controller that returns a timely file at localhost forward slash hello, uh, there's a few important things about that controller. It should not have a at response body annotation. Uh, that at response body annotation is great when we want to return data or when we want to return a string of our own HTML like we saw yesterday, or not yesterday, but last class. Instead, uh, we're just going to just have a, a, a vanilla controller, I guess you can say that, just a regular controller, at controller for the class, and then the, uh, the method itself is going to be like uh, at get mapping or at post mapping or something like that. Um, just not, nothing else there. And so by default, um, these controllers are configured to return a quote unquote template. So something like the timely file, they're already configured to return that. And when we add something like at response body, that breaks that and it, and it won't work right. Uh, and it won't complain a whole lot, I don't think. And so that can be a bit of a sneaky error. 
The other side of it is that we also don't want to use at rest controller on our class. Now, given what we just discussed about not having at response body uh, on the, the method, can someone deduce uh, and tell me why we don't want at rest controller on the class itself? This is a bit of a tougher question, but uh, if you know, you know. No takers? Cool. So the difference between at rest controller and at controller for a class, they, they, they both convert the class into a controller. That annotation will make it a controller. The rest controller essentially adds this at response body to all of the methods automatically. And so it's really good if we have a REST-like controller that's just returning data, it's not returning like timely views. At REST controller is convenient because we don't have to add all these at response bodies onto our methods. But if we have a class that has at REST controller and we try to return a timely template or timely view, uh, it's not gonna work because it's, it's adding this at response body thing that we can't have. So, quick pause. Um, questions, thoughts on what we've covered? And I'm talking about a lot of concepts, we're not really seeing a whole lot of code yet. We will get to that, but any questions? Oh, yes. So, um, in, the, uh, in the exercises, in the uh, reading, mm -hmm. they did a simulation like response body, how is that my controller? Mm -hmm. So with REST controller, can I be like a combination of the controller and the response body? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. At, at the class level. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you didn't hear the, the, the question, um, it was uh, it, in some of the, the reading, there was an example of putting at controller and at response body at the class level. Uh, and so the statement was just doing at REST controller accomplishes the same thing as having those two things at the class level, just having at rest controller instead of those two things will accomplish the same thing as making it at controller and at response body. Yeah, thank you. Uh, cool, other questions, other thoughts? Um, while we're here. No. Okay. So, we can add our HTML templates to our Java code, which is cool. But we can also inject data into our templates, kind of like we did with Angular. Uh, and so there's two parts to this process of injecting data into our, our HTML templates. Uh, one, we have to pass the data into the template. Kind of goes without saying, but that's, that's the step one. And then step two is we need to reference the data in the template, and there's special syntax for that. So here's an example of passing data into the template. You'll notice that we have this model class referenced here inside of our method at the top. And then once we have this set up here, we can do something like model.add attribute. We give the attribute a name. In this case, it would be title. And then we pass in the data as the second argument of this. And so now that we've passed in uh, this, this string right here, and it's named title, it's like, almost like a variable name, in our template, we can reference the data. And what referencing the data looks like is something like this, th, and then we have the colon, text, so this is gonna change the text content of the element, equals, and then we have this special syntax to reference the variable that we just passed in. So we just passed in title, and it's referencing title. And so we could uh, deduce, looking at this right here, the title that we're passing in is aardvark, it's, we're just passing in that string. And then when, when we reference title in our HTML, we can assume that once we render it, it's gonna, that h1 element's gonna say aardvark. Okay, and so here we get to the fun part. Um, 
we're going to collectively, uh, participation is totally optional, but collectively we are going to uh, create a timely project and add as much stuff as we can, can to it reasonably and there will be questions in the middle. We'll see how this goes. I don't know how this will go yet. Um, so, for starters, we will go to uh, the spring initializer, misspelled as they so chose to do. Um, cool. So if you're following along, go ahead and jump over to the spring initializer. Uh, you can see, of course, the link that I posted in general. That will pre-populate all of the, the options. And uh, I'll pause here for a little bit while, while you all get this pulled up. Um, and also talk through, through this. So the when we initially open this, it will be defaulted to Gradle slash Groovy. This is good. Uh, it will default to the language Java. That, of course, is also good. For the Spring Boot version, we need to change this. We don't want anything other than 2.7.11. After that, this part is mostly optional. Um, well, te technically optional, but you can change it if you want to. Uh, we have all of our project metadata set up. I just change this to org.launchcode. I call it the artifact class nine example and call it whatever. Packaging will be defaulted to jar. That's good. The Java language level we need to change. We will change this to Java version 11. Once we have the left side of the screen figured out, then we need to add our dependencies. And so the dependencies we will be adding is Spring Web, as we have the last time we used Spring Initializer. We'll add Spring Boot DevTools, um, as kind of have been in the examples. And then finally, we will add this new dependency, which is Timeleaf. So go ahead and plug all that in, and then you'll press generate uh, or control enter. And this is going to generate a zip file. Zip file is not that large. Uh, from here, you can extract the zip file. I'm not sure what the command looks like on a Mac machine, but what I'm doing is I'm right clicking on it on a Windows machine, I'm clicking extract all. And it just created this new folder right here. I'm going to open that up and take the, the folder with the same name inside of the folder uh, and copy that. And I'm going to move it over to my project folder, which is under users, uh, projects. And I'll just paste that in there. I've already done that, so I'm not going to paste it right now. There's a couple different ways to move this file. That's just the way I went about it. Okay, so once we have the file moved over to our projects folder or wherever you have your projects, um, we will open that, that file, double check that it's the one with the little terminal icon on it because it's gonna work with it a bit better than opening the parent folder. Just open the folder that has the little terminal icon. Okay, and once you open the project, it's gonna start downloading. So, um, I know I'm, I'm talking through this quick gauge on where we're at. Um, how many of us who are participating are have, have caught up to this step? How many of us have not caught up yet? Okay, cool. Let's pause here for just a bit longer. While I'm paused here, let's actually look at what we're going to do next. So I have a bit of a structure. So the first thing we did was we created a new timely project. Um, and then the next thing we're going to do is create a controller that returns a basic time leaf template. So there's a couple pieces to that. We'll get into it. All right, so we want to create a controller. Uh, a good place to put a controller would be inside of a Java package called controllers. So we will do that. Uh, feel free to add a new package. You can right-click, 
um, on the, the main package for the project. And we'll call this controllers. So now we have a Java package called controllers. And inside of here, we will create a new class. Um, what would be a good name for this class? Well, since we're all doing this together, um, I'm not sure what the direction of this website is going to look like, so I'll take a suggestion and have a creative idea, or a very not creative idea, I'm creative for that too. What are we going to call this? What was the website going to be? Time Leaf Controller? Okay, I'll take that. I believe this is Pascal case. So I like it. All right, cool. So we have our Time Leaf Controller. So we added the controller package, and then we added a class called Time Leaf Controller. Now, it's not a controller yet, so what do we need to add? At controller, thank you. At controller, cool. And so we are going to have our first method and we can just make this at home, at just localhost forward slash. And so we will say, um, public class returns, I think the type for the templates is still string. So we're gonna say it returns a string unless we discover otherwise, and we'll call this home. Um, doesn't like something about this yet. Oh, thank you. Public string. Assume return statement, and just for now, I'll just return a string, an empty string, until we return a template. Keep it happy. Uh, and now, since this is going to be a, uh, you also make this bigger. Sorry, I'm jumping around with my thoughts here. Okay, so now that we have this, we want it to be a Git mapping request, so that when we go to the the page. Um, receives a request and we were able to do something with it. So we will say at get mapping, and we don't need to pass anything into this because we just want this to be at, at the home page. Okay, so as a sanity check, I'm gonna just quickly run the application, and we'll even go to the home page and nothing will show up yet, but I just wanna see that nothing is angry. Uh, so we'll go to localhost 8080 and then nothing else. Okay, so we get a, a white label error page. That is not an error I'm concerned about yet. Okay. So once again, we are we're at our time leaf controller, but now we actually need to return a time leaf template. So the place to add templates, of course, is going to be in our template folder. We have nothing in there right now, so we will add a new HTML file. Now, if you're caught up with the reading, you should already have a shortcut for adding a new time leaf file. If you don't have that, uh, feel free to create a new HTML file, and then we're just going to add in one piece. I'll show you what that is. Timely file, we'll just call this home, because we're making the home page. So the one piece that you're going to add in, uh, if you have a, a vanilla HTML file, is this right here. And you can see this, this text right here. It's inside the slides if you need to grab it. Um, you might be able to get away without it. Uh, it's just you might see some red squigglies and complaints from Java. We'll see. Okay, so in here, um, in our HTML file that we just created, um, we're, we'll just say create a new h1 element. Um, let's say, welcome to the home page. And feel free to say whatever you want. This is your own thing. Now, if I go here and I refresh, Nothing is going to happen. Someone tell me why. 
Well, there's, there's a couple of reasons why, but I'll, I'll take one of them. Oh, yes. I haven't connected it to the controller yet. That, that's, a, that's a very good reason why. And so here, what's interesting is when we're using a time leaf template, I kind of expect to need to do something like, you know, like home.html, um, like forward slash templates, and all this kind of stuff. But I believe I can just say home, and it will know what I'm talking about. Let's give that a, a try. Um, let's see if I can get away with just that minimal bit of messaging. Yeah. So it knows what I'm talking about. If I say home, Time Leaf looks in the template folder and checks for an HTML file called home. And so if I had something on here like a at response body, it's not going to know that this is a template. Instead, it's just going to return the string home. And if I don't have the response body there, but I have it up here, it's still going to return the string home instead of the template we just created. And then finally, if I have at rest controller instead of just at controller, let it reload and refresh, it still just returns the string home. And so I just want to point all that out um, so I can see this coming up pretty easily. So what we need is just simply the, the controller and then the mapping for for the method. And when we have those two things in place, it's going to recognize that we're intending to return a template, not just data. So if I'll refresh, we're back to our template. Cool. So we've kind of sped along, maybe a bit too fast, but we made it here. Um, so I'm going to pause here for questions. Um, what are your last questions? Yes. Into, oh, yeah. This right here? Right, so what I did on my machine was I right clicked on templates, I hovered over new, and I have a preset that I created. You may not have this yet. And so if you don't have the time leaf preset, what we can do is we can create a new HTML file. Um, and I'll just call this um, other page because we're being creative with names today. All right, so I can you, you could create a new HTML file that looks very similar to the timely file. Um, and then in order to make it like the timely file, I'm going to post this into general. Just I'll just do the whole tag. So you just replace the tag to general. You can copy this bit of HTML syntax from general, and then you can place it, replace this right here that comes with the basic HTML template. So give you a minute to catch up to, to grab that and, and to copy it and paste it. Oh, yes? Can you close the meta that you close? Um, oh, yeah, self close meta tag. So once you have this, you will also want to uh, make the meta tag self-closing. So it's going to start off like, like this, and you're just going to add a forward slash to it. So your HTML file should look exactly like this, where we have the XMLNS thing right here, and we have the, the self-closing tag for meta tag. We caught up to here. Good, all right, cool. The next thing we'll wanna do is right click. I think, is it right click? No, no, no. Have this file selected and then go to file, save file as template. So we'll have, oops, we'll have this file selected and we'll go to file, save file as template and we'll call this timely leaf. 
And that will have that set up as a preset for the next time you want to create a, a timely template. Yeah, cool. Thanks for the question. Also, thanks for the assist. Um, other, other questions? Yes? Right. Um, so here we have our controller. Um, this is living in our controllers package. That part isn't super critical, I don't think. Um, we have the, on the class, we have at controller. On the method, we have our get mapping. And then our return statement is a string with the same name as the template. And I'm, I'm curious if it works if I say home.html. I know I just, if I say home, that works, but my own curiosity is asking the question. Yeah. So we, we can say, and honestly, it might be a little bit more obvious if we put .html on it, but essentially we're just referencing the file name. Yeah. And then that's enough for time in the background to, to draw the connections and work with it. Cool. Did that work? Did you have a follow-up question? No, cool. All right. Uh, other, other, other questions while we're here. Yeah, cool. All right. Let's look and see what is next for us to add onto here. So, we've accomplished creating a controller that returns a basic timely template. Now we're going to do something and take this, like, way to the next level, make this ten times more useful, and that is we're going to figure out how to pass data to the template from the controller. So how to inject data into our HTML, very powerful tool. So the first thing we'll need to do is, um, we'll, we'll stick with, with just the home page. We're not gonna add a bunch of pages to this, we'll keep it simple. Uh, and so we'll add something called model. Now in, in the workbook, um, Chris calls this out uh, in one of the videos, but the model here shouldn't be confused, even though it'd be easy to, it should, the model here should not be confused with when we say MVC model view controller, because when we talk about MVC, the model is referring to the data. In this case, model is a specific um, uh, like time leaf syntax here uh, for passing in data. So the model is referencing the, the data portion of the time leaf template. So, so model, model. I don't have it imported yet, so I can click on that and do Alt Enter. That will import it. And so now, now that we have this right here, we can say model dot, we have a bunch of different options here. Um, we're going to start with something basic. We'll just say add attribute. And the first argument that we're passing in to add attribute is the name, the variable name per se. And so this, uh, what, what should we call this? Uh, something that makes it obvious that it's random. We'll call this Kiwi. The second thing that we pass into the model is data. And we can pass in an object, uh, like, like a Hash map, we can pass in an array list, um, we can even pass in a custom class that we write. Uh, in this case, we're going to keep it simple and we're just going to um, add, just pass in a string. So we'll say, um, I'm just going to call it test because creativity is on power 10 right now. All right, so we're passing in the string test, and the value has the name, the variable name per se, uh, is Kiwi. So now if I refresh my project, nothing's changed yet. So just because we, we passed data into the template doesn't mean we've done anything with it yet. So let's prove that we were successful in passing data in. So I'm going to recap what our controller looks like. 
we are referencing model here. Model is imported from springframework.ui. And then we are referencing this and saying model.add attribute. And we're passing in essentially key value. So now we're going to switch over to our home page. This is our, our, our HTML, um, timely flavored HTML. And we will add a paragraph. Now the paragraph can be empty. Uh, inside here, we're going to reference time leaf with th, short for time leaf. And then we'll do colon. And there's a lot of options of what we can do right next. But since we're just going to want to change the text value of the paragraph element, we're going to say text equals, we're going to do dollar sign because we're referencing a variable. Curly brackets, opening, curly bracket, closing. And then in here, we're going to reference our variable. So we'll say Kiwi. So that's what it should look like. We are referencing time leaf. We're saying it's a text. Text is what we're going to use time leaf to change. Equals a string with this variable in it. Let's refresh. Hopefully, I got my syntax right. I did that from memory. We never know. Let's refresh the page. And it says test right here. Not Kiwi. It says test because test was the string we passed in. Kiwi was, just, Kiwi was the name of the value. So that's cool. So even though this is a very small example of something we just did, it really is a huge thing with so much potential because we're now able to use Java to pass data into our otherwise uh, static HTML. Uh, and also to sort of point this as a string, we can say the data passed into let's try this. Let's refresh. Oh, maybe it doesn't like that. I thought I could get away with that. Ah, something like quotes plus, thank you. Refresh. Yeah, there we go. Cool. Thank you. Also, a big thing the workbook talks about when it comes to time leaf is that it's great to have default values. And can someone tell me how I could add a default value to the paragraph elements? How could I how could I add a default text value? Meaning that if data is not passed into it, if we just open this write in a web browser without using Java to spin everything up. How can we get the, the P tag to say something? Sure. So we could say um, data will be here. I guess. Something very confident. All right. Data will be here, I guess. And so, I mean, if we refresh the page, it's just going to show the data we passed into it. Um, however, if I go into the project so many layers to this and I open up the home page just as vanilla JS we can see welcome to the home page looks the same and then our default values are right there so it's, it's not being replaced by Java with the whole time leaf syntax so this is my HTML page just as is Cool. So yeah, we, we covered actually quite a bit um, in less time than I thought it would take. Uh, we can do a bit more. We can add in CSS. That was sort of the last goal for this cut-along. Um, but I really want to stop for questions and 
especially if there's a part that, that you might have gotten stuck on or, or uh, confused by, anything like that, just want clarification, it's a great time to ask. So any, any questions so far? Yes. Uh, go back to the time leaf controller. Um, what was the, the follow up to that? Oh, the import. Right. So here, controller um, I got by at controller forward tab, it, it guessed it correctly for the model. Um, I think it guessed that one correctly as well. Um, but if it doesn't, th these are you, you'll want to see something that says Spring Framework dot. You know, that's, that's a good sign that your import is correct. So it says Spring Framework, and you're working with Spring. Yeah. Um, it is frustrating though when, when you import something and Java guess is wrong uh, and you don't realize it because uh, it, it looks right. The code's happy. Uh, cool. Are there other thoughts, questions, uh, thoughts that uh, come to mind? No? All right, cool. Um, let's add a CSS file to our to our, our template. So normally with HTML, um, we could just reference CS fi CSS file. Uh, and say, hey, it, you know, the CSS file is in the same folder as me, so it's the, 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 the reference is dot forward slash styles.css. Uh, for this, I'm just going to go ahead and copy the syntax. Also paste it below this. So what we're going to have here is we're going to have some time leaf syntax to help uh, wire the, the style sheet to our HTML. So we have a, a link element. That's, that's the same as a vanilla uh, HTML file. Uh, the, the rel equals spreadsheet, or I'm sorry, style sheet. That's the same. That's the same as normal. The only thing that's, that's really special is the href has the time leaf syntax in front of it. And then the way we reference it is with the at symbol. And so if we add this to our time leaf, it's going to look for styles.css inside of our static folder. So I'll do new. CSS is not listed. Any recommendations on how I could add a CSS file to my static folder? Okay, let's try that. Just add a file, call it styles.css. See if this works, press enter, and it does work, that's great. So we can also see that uh, IntelliJ immediately recognizes this as a CSS file. We have a little CSS icon. Um, and so to add a CSS file, it's just going to be new, file, and then you'll just need to add the .css so it knows what it's talking about. And so in here, I just want to prove that our time leaf template is in fact wired up appropriately to our CSS. So I'll say something like HTML, and then I push the button. Uh, background dash color, and then we could do a few different ways to add color to CSS. You might have your own way you're familiar with. A, a common one that's easier to remember is RGB, and then we put three values in here between zero and 255. So 255 here is 100% red, and then 255 here is 100% green, and 255 here is 100% blue. And so if we have 100% red, green, and blue, it's going to be white. And if we do zero, that's some weird like insert thing, press, that's okay, I'll work around it. If we go zero, 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 
That means we have zero red, zero green, zero blue. It's going to be black. And so if I wanted to do something like um, a muted green, we could do a little bit of red. We could do a lot of green. And we could do a little bit of blue. And we'll refresh and see if it works. That's not very muted, but it's, it's better than full power. Uh, cool. So we can see that our CSS uh, does, in fact, work. Um, the part that matters here is I will say, cool. Um, awesome. So I think that, that this is basically it for lecture. We'll pause here for, for last bits of questions here, and then we'll transition over to studio. Uh, yes, question. Sure, so a um, few things to call out here. This is where we connected our HTML to our CSS. Uh, note that we're not using the dollar sign. Instead, we are using the at symbol. Uh, and then from here, the forward slash is not strictly necessary, but it, uh, it, we do have it here in this example. And we have the name of the file. If you don't have rel style sheet, it may not work. Yeah. Cool. Can you go back to value style or right. So, oops. I think it's insert. That's probably what I have. There we go. Uh, so what I did was, uh, as, a, as a quick recap on CSS, there are two essential parts to it. You select something. In this case, I'm selecting the entire HTML document, to be more specific and just select the P element. And then inside the curly brackets, you apply styles. So styles are key value. And so if I refresh this, the background color is now only applied to the P tag. Oh, um, talking about the file itself. Oh, gotcha. I misunderstood. So the way we did that was we went to new, went to file, then we had the name of the file, and we did dot CSS. And that was what it took for uh, IntelliJ to recognize it. Cool. Sorry, I misunderstood your question there. Uh, awesome. Uh, any, any other questions before we wrap up? Great questions, by the way. Uh, I, th I think that the, the live coding went okay. Um, I'm always worried about it just being a disaster and like no one can download anything or something like that coming up. But I think, I think this worked. So we, we, we may try this again. Uh, cool. So that's it for lecture. Uh, we'll go ahead and break the studio, and I'll see you all back here at 8 for a studio review.